I am thrilled today's guest. I'm a big fan, Jen Psaki. Uh, she, of course, hosts Inside with Jen Psaki Sundays at noon and Mondays at 8 p.m. She's the former press secretary under President Biden, deputy press secretary under uh, President Obama. Uh, she's got a brand new book that I'm going to sell. I'm going to use my skills and, and sell it right Please, now. Before I need I, all this. I need all the Donnie Deutsch selling and branding I can take. The, the I'm going to take it all in. The book is Say More Lessons from Work, the White House and the World. Um, it's going to be a major bestseller. This is a great book because basically if you've got to manage a boss, if you've got to communicate to anybody, if you've got to take feedback, if you've got to get into an argument with a Trump voter, uh, this is going to give you the tools and who better than the person who was basically communicating on behalf of the most powerful people on the planet to other people, how to simplify messages, how to deal with bullies, uh, how to kind of overcome imposter syndrome, everything we all have. This is a, this is a must have book. Jen Saki, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. That was such a good pitch. No wonder you're so successful at what you do. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to record it and start using that as my book pitch. No, as I, it really is a great, there's so much news you could use. And I, I'm going to start right in with the most interesting, I think I can handle anybody, communicate anything, take anything. The most difficult thing to now is talking politics with somebody. Is yeah. how, do you, how do you, let's say most of our listeners are probably Biden voters, not Trump voters. And I try so hard with Trump voters to engage. And mm -hmm. how do you now in this incredibly polarized situation, give me some tools to help out. I'm talking to a Trump voter. I want to engage. I want to get them to hear what I'm saying. I don't want to negate them. I don't want to, you know, shut them down. Give me some tools I can use. Well, first you have to decide if you engage, right? And whether right. it's worthwhile to engage or not, which is a gut instinct thing. The second thing is you find a point of commonality. I mean, you and I do Morning Joe a lot. We yeah. sometimes talk about sports, right? Yeah, right? There are things people have in common. You talk about your kids. You talk about your struggle with teacher appreciation week, which is next week and what all the things you have to do. You find a, an entry point. You just want people to be willing to kick the door open a little bit. Now you're a known entity and I'm a known entity in certain universes. So people are going to prejudge what we're going to come at them with. Right. But the first thing is lower the barrier so that you can have an entryway into that conversation. I love what you talked about with bullies in the book, dealing with Rahm Emanuel and who's a tough guy. <laughs> and we all know a lot of bullies. So let's say you're yeah. dealing with an intimidating person. Either you have to take feedback or give feedback yeah. Whether it be a tough boss, give me some tools. You know, the one of the pieces in there I talk about a lot, which I think, you, and you are so familiar with all of the ins and outs and challenges in the private sector, and I think this is very applicable advice for this, is when you hire a team and you're a person reporting to a boss as a communications person, marketing, or any other job, bosses don't like yes men and yes women. Amen. Sometimes they amen, do. Amen, amen, amen. But this is like... I didn't learn this for a while, but it is so important for people to understand. Now, it doesn't mean, I mean, I talk a little bit about Ram in there and you know Ram. It's like yeah. with Ram, it's like screaming at a, an angry dog. You yeah. have to scream at a, the angry a rabid, dog. A, ra a rabid dog. A rabid dog. A rabid dog. Yeah. You have to scream back at the a rabid dog. And I learned that with him. I had to do that. Um, and I tell a story about when I was in my 20s and he had asked me to call a New York Times reporter I w literally went to the ladies room and I came back, I called the reporter and he had already called her and I was so pissed off. I just in the moment marched into his office and said, either you're the spokesperson or I am, you make yeah. a choice, yeah. which I don't, doesn't work with everybody, but it was a real moving forward point in our relationship. But I think the key thing is whether it's a, an angry dog or just a different kind of boss and all bosses are different. You have to find a way to give real feedback real feedback that is concrete, that is honest, that is direct, because that's what you're there for. I always found the more powerful the person, the more honesty that they respect. They be, two things happen. Yes. It's number one, they need it because they don't get it. And number two, it says about you, the person giving the, the, the honesty, how confident you are and the value that you bring to the table. Yes, it's so true. And I think there's a misunderstanding that you should, and I had this, and I talk about this, my own journey on this, that your job is to just say, yes, I will implement that. Yes, I will do that. Yes, that's a good idea. Yes, you were great. And look, people like that to a certain degree, but ultimately to your point, the more powerful you are, whether you're a president or a CEO or just running a big division of a company or nonprofit, whatever it may be, you don't get a lot of that. You need that because 
everybody's evolving and growing and getting better and they need people who they can trust to give them that kind of feedback. There's another thing in the book that I, I have so believed in for so long. I used, I used to say it as act as if, but Robert Gibbs, your predecessor, oh, said, yeah. said to you kind of like, you got to act like you belong here. And I think that's so critical for anybody. So, so critical. And we all have, I love that you said you have a version of imposter syndrome, because I think that probably, maybe doesn't shock your listeners, but I think what shocks some people, I also do sometimes as well. And, you know, I, I think everybody does to some degree. Everybody, because everybody. If you every don't, time if you don't, you lose touch. That's, you lose that's, touch. that's Trump's problem. He doesn't have imposter yeah. syndrome. Perfect. Yes. And you're not, you're not trying to prove yourself. No. I love being underestimated. It's the greatest gift ever that's ever happened to me in my career. And I'm almost always underestimated. I love that. But I think the point I was, what was the, I got, now I lost my point. You about were asking act, me about, act, act as if, you know, like you've been there. And the key thing there, and, and this was Robert Gibbs saying to me, I, I had been working for Barack Obama. I had kind of been this young staffer who had been traveling around with him and was seen as this like organized person who just like went with the flow. And I wanted to transition to somebody who was seen as a strategist and seen as somebody who could really give him good at political advice. I knew what to give him, the advice, but I wanted to be seen that way. And his advice was, as you said, he's got a Southern draw, which I can't do well, but like, act like you belong there. You do. And at a certain point, people will believe it. It's very true. At a certain point, you get comfortable in the room you're in because you force yourself to be comfortable in the room you're in. That's it. You bring up an issue with the people in their career deal with a lot. It's very interesting in a new job where you got a promotion to be seen as that person. Mm -hmm. How do you, when people see you a certain way, let's say you're seen as an assistant and you don't want to leave the company, but you want to be perceived a different way, but everybody sees you as the assistant. What do you do? Well, I think there's two things to do. One is sometimes you have to leave and come back. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Which I think my experience of that is when I went to the State Department, I was a spokesperson there. I was seen differently when I went back to the White House. Um, and people have this experience. You may love your company and that's amazing. And maybe you want to go back, but maybe you need to be seen differently. The second thing I would say is crush your job that you're in. This is pretty simple advice, but I always give it to people who are right out of college who are like, I want to just lay out my plan for North Korea. I'm like, nobody wants your plan on North Korea. They want you to kill the job you're in, right? And then you'll have more opportunities, but then ask to do more. I am always shocked by how shocked, surprised by how many people, there are many people who are great in their twenties, but who don't ask to do more yeah. and don't show up. Um, and I think this is a loss. I'm not, if you can work from home and that works for your job, good for you, but you're missing out I think on working, mentoring I think, experiences I think we're, we're, on showing up and do it and being able to be given more because you are given more when you show up. Um, I can't agree with you more. I'm so worried about this generation that stays at home at work. I can't even, I used to run an ad agency with a thousand people. I can't fathom not being at work either as a mentor or a mentee it, it just we're gonna lose something we just are yeah I, and i and i think it's sometimes it's misunderstood i don't know if you experience this when you talk to people as like uh an old school, old school like we have to wear yeah, yeah, yeah. suit like no you don't have to wear a pinstripe suit and fancy shoes i'm talking about when we're working on a script for a show here, it's like we look around, it's like, who's around, you know? Or we're, we're, we're when I was in the White House or on a political campaign, I, I advanced in politics because I showed up and I was there. And I was the person who was happy to pitch the story at midnight. And I was happy to follow up with the reporter at 11 p.m. And I was just around. So I had opportunities. You have to prove yourself through that. But I think that is sometimes um, it, it's you're missing out when you don't participate in that. There was so much in the book I related to. And as I said, I had different phrases. I used to say failure is your friend. You have to fail. You talk about your mistakes and some yeah. of the mistakes you had, whether it had to do with Brett Baer or Afghanistan and that that's where you grow from. So tell, totally. let's, talk, let's talk about some of those mistakes and what you did with them. Well, you know, I, I the Brett Baer story I kind of love because, um, I mean, anyone who knows who I am will think, oh, she's a Democrat. She's like, she hates Fox News. And a lot, I hate a lot of things they do, but not the people, not necessarily every person at all. And the story is about how when I was newly in the Obama administration, maybe six to eight months in, you probably remember when we um, we named the Pazar Ken Feinberg. It was quite controversial yes, right, yes, in the yes, business world. Yes, yes. And we were setting up interviews for him. 
we kind of had a little scuffle with, uh, it was a stressful day because everyone talked to him. We didn't have time to have everybody talk to him. Fox News didn't ask for an interview. We gave them one anyway. They complained still. Anyway, point is, I was very annoyed at the end of the day. And in an email, I said, I said I'm watching the news. I watched Brett Baer's piece. Uh, it was crazy, but he's a lunatic anyway, right? And then mm -hmm. I was like, I'm so tired of Fox News. I wish I could just stick a dead fish in their cubby hole. Now, that is a <laughs> reference to something Rahm Emanuel has done. And it was like an ongoing joke in the White House, but right. it doesn't translate. And also, it's like, be careful what you write in email. But these emails were released. Um, when it came out, I was horrified. And I always think about what my mother would think. My mother does not care if I'm on television or if I work in the White of House. She cares not, right. if I'm like... A, a good nice person, person a good person yeah and she doesn't care and i was like she's gonna see these emails and and think like what were you thinking right <laughs> and so i sent brett bear this email that just said basically i'm so sorry i know you don't know me but that is not how i interact with people and i just had a an a rough day and i should never have said that he didn't need to reply he could have replied and said thank you or whatever many sane people would have and instead he asked me out to lunch yeah. And we went to lunch and we talked about our families and that taught me a lot about, um, I still disagree with a lot of things he says on TV, but that was a graceful way to handle a complete screw up you just by like a 30 you, year old kid. You just confronted. And I, it taught me a right lot about yeah. how you deal with that, with people who make mistakes, um, who you could be a jerk about. Another thing that is so valuable in the book that so many people take for granted, it's such a duh but people don't think about that. You have to know your audience. The key, yes. to, the key to selling and the key to great communicating is great selling is I was always good at putting myself in the other guy's head, the other person's head. Yeah. And, and it's amazing how many people don't do that. They come in with their spiel. You have to come from the other person's perspective. Totally. And communicating just like marketing is about accomplishing a goal. I mean, it's like you're trying to sell something. You're trying to improve your polling. You're trying to get a bill passed. Um, I think this is so important. Anytime anyone says, also when I raise this question, it's everyone. I'm like, everyone is no one, okay? Everyone. Like everyone is no one. It has to be specific. Who is your audience? It can be multiple different people. That's okay. It can be different groups of people. But if you don't know your audience, you don't know what you're trying to accomplish because you don't know who you're trying to move. I hear you. All right, let's start. We're going to come back to the book. Let's talk a little politics. Sure. I, I'm worried as we all are. Uh, yeah. I, th I think if the election was today. Everyone should be worried. I, there, uh, if the election was today, Trump would win. I, I, I mean, I feel fairly certain of that. There's a long time between now and then. Okay. So, I don't know if I totally agree okay, with you on that okay. front, but I'm, that's I'm, okay. I'm just so worried the combination of the chaos between the campuses and the border yeah. and inflation and people's not comprehending how fragile, how, what will happen to our democracy. The thing I keep saying on the air is, and I just came from a lunch where you explained, would well, you understand if Trump gets elected that there really won't be any more real elections and that yeah. the, F, he's, the FCC is going to report to him and if he doesn't like a show, it's going to be off the air. And then it's he's going to be bring, canceled. He's going to bring yeah. back the Insurrection Act and bring back the military and and he's going to put his enemies with that. Life as we know, is going to, they're, not compre they're not getting it. And their heads tilt to the side. How do you yeah. get that message out there? I mean, if you don't know, I'm a little concerned. <laughs> I mean, look, I think that there's this debate, and I'd be interested in your view on this. I've probably heard you talk about this on like whether or not we should talk about Trump more or less. I'm of the view we have to talk about him more because I'm we need people view. to understand the stakes. And sometimes when I do kind of, you know, reads or scripts or, or what interviews on my show where I say, this is Project 2025. I keep this talking about Project 25. Thing. I keep bringing, people don't even know it exists. They don't people, know. It's they, a thousand pages. It's on the Heritage it's website. It's Heritage and it's Charlie Kirk and it's it's the plan. It's the mission statement. It's, it's the it. plan. Yeah. And I think the best thing, I'm not saying this is going to solve all of your concerns, but we have to talk about it and talk about it in specifics because, uh, you, you know, I think it's like sometimes like democracy is at risk. Like, yes, but it's like, abstract. You have to make it like, real. You have to understand. Yes. Guess, guess what? Do you understand that there might be a registry for women in red states who are pregnant? Who do are you, pregnant? Do you understand your grandchild will never have a real vote again? Do yes. you understand that the, if, if the TV show you like, if you like Seth Meyers and he doesn't like Seth Meyers jokes, 
they'll be off the air. Do yeah. you, and, and they kind of, they don't believe you. I, 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 but I agree with you. I've been saying the same thing. You got to put, you got to fill in the dots. You can't just say democracy. You can't say freedom. You can't say fascism. You have to say, this is how dark it will be. Yes, completely. Because I think, I mean, unfortunately, we've been in a legit battle for our democracy for many years now. And I think aside from the hardcore people who are very concerned and are motivated by this issue, people can tune it, could potentially tune it out if they feel like it's just, you know, Elizabethan. Yeah, theory. 100,000 yeah, foot, yeah. 100, foot language. It needs to be specific. Biden, as far as I'm concerned, if I'm keeping score at home, I would give him an A minus as a president. I mean, if you really look at more legislative victories than, than anybody, um, he, he brought us back from the pandemic. Uh, he is, I think, handled the Israeli situation and the Ukrainian situation as well as it can be handled. The economy is great. Yes, we have inflation as a problem. Uh, infrastructure, I can go on and on and on. Yet, it doesn't stick with him for some reason. The amount yeah. of people I talk, no, he sucks. He's, just, he's done, yes, he comes off as old. Yes, there's 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 the the what I call the, the the sizzle part that may not be there, but the steak has been there. Why does it not land? I wish I knew the que- answer to this bazillion dollar question. Yeah. I think there's a couple of factors in my view, and you probably have a strong view on why this is too. One, it is um, a very challenging media environment for the White House to operate in. And I don't mean that as a critique of the media at all. I mean it for a couple of reasons. One is his opponent facing four indictments and multiple criminal charges and trials that are happening. People can criticize whether it should be covered or not covered. That debate can happen. It's a historic moment. I mean, a dark one, but of course it should be covered, right? And so it is hard for them to break through. They're not having a normal debate about social security or healthcare or Obamacare. There are moments where he does. And I think he's got to look for more moments that are, it's like less volume and more impact moments mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like Howard Stern or like, that's, right. that's what you do. Things you like got, that. That was so brilliant about Stern where it was such a smart place to go. Look, he's not going to go on Fox. You're going to be set up and you know, uh, you're going to get, uh, you know, bombarded with nonsense, but Stern goes to a much wider audience than he's used yeah. to talk to, but it was still a smart, it was such a smart place to go. Because, totally. And, and he did a great job. I thought he did a great job. Yeah, and, and Howard Stern's a great interviewer. Yeah. I mean, you can like him or not like him, it doesn't matter. I, I, I think he's a great interviewer. He's one you of know, the best. I, I think the thing that when you're in the White House, as we were talking about audience, especially when you're talking about a campaign, is you really have to think carefully about how you expand the audience. I mean, beyond the people who are going to ch- dub, you know click on whitehouse.gov. For a campaign, you need to f- you need to meet people where they are and find the people who need to hear things about you. I mean, we're in a we're also in a very divided country, and yeah. as you know, there's a large percentage of people met, rep, registered Republicans who still believe 2020 was won by Trump. That is Se- what you're up seventy against. seventy percent seventy percent. So, are there things? That, it's very easy for me to kind of backseat drive in this now that I'm not there. And you always hate this when you're sitting in the right. White House. Are there things they could be doing differently and better? Sure, but I also think there are uniquely challenging circumstances for them in terms of the media environment in this moment. Yeah, it is. Look, nope. Every president from here on in, hopefully there will be more presidents from here on in, is going to be operating somewhere in the low 40s. The country's just set up that way. I mean, the days of 60% approval ratings, we're not going to see that again. We're not going to see that again. I agree completely. I have a theory that's bothering me about Trump right now that I actually think the trial, not that it's helping him, I I don't buy that bullshit, but the fact that he's quiet helps him. The, old, mm. the biggest the biggest advantage the Democrats could have is if he's out loose Him talking, talking every day. And right now he's not. And I think that's hurting. That's such an interesting take because do you remember when the trial, and I agree with this, and I had never thought of this, like, remember when the trial was starting and it was like this very valid debate about, well, is it, should, the, should, should they have this microphone that he can go out and talk at in the courthouse? And it was like, Probably not, but also like if he goes out and says crazy things, it's like not necessarily to me the worst thing for the Biden team if it's like every day. And he really has, I mean, nothing he's said is like broken through really from yeah. those forums. Um, he still has his rallies, of course, but he's sitting there in the seat and is pretty quiet. Um, 
it's hard to know, right? I mean, are you a believer that if he's convicted in this trial, this will move a portion of the electorate or not? Uh, I don't think dramatic. I, I know I know in re, in studies, in, in polls, they're saying that 25% of Republicans said they're going to move on. He's not going to do jail time. Uh, it's not, for, it, by the way, they should have brought the case, but it's still obviously not the election interference case for the January yeah. 6th case. And I don't think it's going to move. I, I, I don't think it's going to move. If that's what the Democrats are waiting for, I don't should. think they are. I, I don't actually think the campaign is, right. as far as I know. I think it's more, there's kind of an in the ether, like Democrats writ large, like people who hate Trump are waiting for that moment to be the defining moment. I think the defining group, and I've said this on the air many times, and, and you know, Carvel used to say it's the economy stupid. It's the women stupid. Yeah. I think women are going, if the, if the, we get the message ring right with women, you know, we obviously know where that starts with abortion. But it's so much more than that. It's healthcare. It's just, it's, I think if not only the women, but the women who talk to their husbands and fathers and sons and say, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? So not only, but to be surrogates at the same time. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's the women um, of all ages, frankly. I mean, I, I yes. think it's interesting around 2022, right before 2022 election, I went out door knocking with a bunch of Planned Parenthood volunteers. And what was interesting is hearing from some women who are long past childbearing age, right? But we're like, I don't want this to happen to my granddaughters and to my daughters. And it, it, it you know, abortion rights, healthcare access, it does have this like visceral uh, reaction from people that, that has, at, at least as we've seen in special elections and in 2022, transcended political party. Um, and that's a big challenge. I mean, just look at Arizona, right? Arizona, the, I mean, not Carrie Lake, I mean, not Carrie Lake, I'm sorry, Katie Hobbs, you know, she signed the repeal. It's still very complicated there. It's still very much at risk. Carrie Lake is like turning herself into a pretzel, trying to be kind of not anti-abortion access. It tells you a lot. And that's a pretty pivotal state. So we'll see. Well, I want to bounce one thing. Off. I keep talking about this on the air. And of course, everybody says, what would you do if you're the advertiser guy? Is there a silver bullet? There's no silver bullet. There is one commercial that, oh, I, think, let's hear it. that I think would change things. And I don't know if it can happen or not. If you get Millie McMaster, Kelly and Mattis, black yeah. and white, talking to camera, saying, I just care about this country. We yeah. know it can't, it's not the other people that work for him. It's those four generals, Mount Rushmore who yeah. come out and say, I, I don't care if Democrat Republican. I don't care about right to life. I don't care. Like we're not going to be okay. If you care about your children, that will move voters. And do you think people know who they are? They'll know from the ads. I mean, the, yeah. you'll, you'll, the, these are the generals. These are the, you know, and it's yeah. just, if, if the, and I'm thinking physically what they look like yeah. and who they are. Not cabinet members, not yep. people that work for him. It's got to be these generals. Military, yeah. And, and the, the top guys who basically are saying it's not going to be okay. Going back to my yeah. early, earlier message. That, I keep begging on the air, that that to me is as close to a silver bullet as you would come. That is incredibly powerful. First of all, Chairman Milley would play himself in a movie because right. he just looks yeah. like he's you chairman know. of the yeah. Joint Chiefs. Um, and Madison Kelly, a, I, I, come a Mad on. <laughs> all of them. Yeah, Mad Dog Mattis. You know, I don't know the dynamics of what's happening. I know that a lot of people like them feel tremendously under threat, right? Every time they're in public, and I don't know how that's a factor for them or not, yeah. or their families. Frankly, I mean, yeah. sometimes people who have been in public life are like, it's fine. And their spouses and grandkids and children are like, it's not fine. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure the Biden campaign would love to do something yeah. like that. And I wonder just if there's a willingness or if they've asked. I don't know that. Let's get back to the book a little bit. Something that's so important for everybody is balance in life. And you talk about a, a great story about going to your kid's kindergarten the same day. There was a major, yeah. major Afghanistan situation going on. Yeah. I mean, you know, this was probably the worst day that I had in the Biden White House. Um, and there are tough days, no doubt. But any time, of course, men and women who serve the United States die, it is the worst day. And um, this day started with a meeting in the Situation Room, which I was sitting in on every day just because I was speaking um, in the briefing. It was predominantly about Afghanistan at the time. And I remember walking into the room and John Finer, who's the deputy national security advisor at the time, still was, 
they had been kind of conveying, we need the press to understand that there are legitimate terrorist threats. I mean, not this was not in a providing classified information. This was just like, they need to understand. And I said to him, I think, I think we're helping them understand. And he said, there's been an attack. And I just remember this so distinctly sitting down in the room. And as the meeting was proceeding, um, getting updates. Now, this is the group of national security officials running the government. So they can't sit there and put their hands in their head and cry. You want to, people yeah. want to, I'm yeah. sure you can't, you have to move forward. But that day, as I, as I talk about in my book was also my daughter who was five at the time, her open house at her kindergarten. And I knew I wanted to go there and, um, and did not miss it. And I didn't know if I would have to, and my husband said, it'll be fine. We'll have a great time. We'll send you pictures. And I was like, I don't want to miss it. I don't want her to be impacted by the career path. I am fortunate to be a part of, but I chose, she did not choose. She right. wants to have her mom at her kindergarten open house. I made it. I always tell people I didn't tell anyone I was leaving, which they're like, that's weird. And I'm like, no, because you know what? It was like a crisis. Like I, I'm not going to be like, I'll be back uh, in not, a few right, hours. Right, I knew right. I'd be back. Um, and you figured it out and you and figure it out and you figure it out. And I'm grateful that of course that I was there and I fortunately made it back in time for the remarks review, as we say. Give us a little uh, two moments behind the scenes. You know, we to me the simple choice between Biden and Trump is decency versus indecency. And every president before Trump, I believe, is is a decent mayor. I will talk mm -hmm. about Nixon in another place, but whether it's Carter, whether it's George W., whether it's Bush Senior, or the Clinton, I think at their heart they were decent human beings. Mm -hmm. Give me two moments of decency. One of Obama and one of Biden, just little human moments. You may have never talked about them that you saw that you just go, this is a, this is a good guy. This is a good guy. This is a good, you know, I think the thing that, um, oh, such a good question. I'm going to have to think. Okay. So with president Biden, what I think people, you, most people don't see it because most people don't spend a lot of time with the president Sure, is that he is a completely, um, like, down to earth person who's more connected he's more comfortable like outside of his church in scranton than he yeah, is necessarily and you see that you see that yeah yeah walking the halls of the white house it's not that he's uncomfortable with the responsibility of his job there's a difference right it's more the pomp and circumstance um and um i saw so many moments of just humanity with him i mean his connection to his grandkids is one that i think like anybody could connect to who has yeah. grandkids or where i remember his his one of his granddaughters walking in, we were at a meeting at some point and he said, we stopped the meeting. He said, tell him about your paper. It's so amazing. <laughs> tell him about your paper. And I can't remember which granddaughter it was. I wish I did. And she she was like, oh, my I'm sure she was like, right. pop, they call him pop, you know, pop. Oh, my God, pop. Like, you know, she told us about her paper. We were like, oh, that's so cool. You know, but he paused the meeting. He always picks up the phone when they call. And then as she was leaving, he did the most grandpa thing ever. We was like, you dropped something on the floor and it was like a $20 <laughs> bill. <laughs> I was like, Oh my God. It's like, but that's who he is. You know, it was cutest, probably a, a, a meeting story. about a tough policy issue. And um, give me an Obama one. President Obama, you know, I also, he, he kind of holds his cards close to his chest in a, in a way different from Biden, yes. but for him, and I did work for him for 10 years. And I remember being so, um, stressed out when I, Dennis McDonough, who you know, who was the chief of staff at the mm -hmm. time, called me um, about coming back to be the White House communications director after our mutual friend, Jennifer Palmieri, was going back to work for Clinton. And President Obama not only called me and was like, what are you doing for daycare? It'll be, it's going to be fine. Children are the greatest thing ever. We'll figure it all out. But even when I came back from um, maternity leave, I mean, he had a lot going on in his life. He was like, just tell me what you need. I yeah. know this is what you asked for. You just tell me what you need. You need to leave. You need to go to a doctor's appointment. And that was, I know everybody doesn't experience that. I'm incredibly, I worked for two presidents who were like that. Yeah. But President Obama had this connection with family and his daughters. And there were so many pregnant people in the last two years. It was like, I don't know, we were repopulating right. the planet. <laughs> but he just loved that that was like a part of what was going on. And to him, it wasn't like, oh, you can't be the White House communications director because you're pregnant and you have a newborn. It was like, we need to adjust things to work for you. 
And I don't think, you know, people don't always get to see that. Um, and I was very fortunate to experience both of those things. Jen Saki, I promised I would be sensitive to your time. I've loved your ascension. I think you're fantastic. Thank you. Got to watch Jen, uh, noon on Sundays, Monday nights at eight o'clock and the new book, which is really a must. I'm just telling you somebody who motivates people and who ran a big business and understands communication. This is a real, real, real important book. The book is Say More Lessons from Work, the White House and the World. It's out and it's going to be a major, major bestseller. Thanks, Jen. I appreciate it. Donnie George, thank you so much. I loved our conversation. I Great enjoyed talking it. With you. you too. Stay Have well. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand. And just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.